the DNC recently released its preliminary 2020 debate schedule, and I think it's kind of a mixed bag. There are some good aspects about it, but there's also some things that I do find problematic, but certainly... It's definitely better than 2016. Um, I don't think that that's even questionable at this point, but let's go ahead and get to the details and then I'll tell you my opinion on it. So as Michael Schurer of the Washington Post reports, Democratic presidential candidates will meet in June for the first of at least 12 planned primary debates of the 2020 election cycle under a plan released Thursday by party officials who said they were determined to create large debate audiences with broad candidate participation. Ticket entry to the early debate stages will be determined by a combination of polling, grassroots financial support, and other factors in an effort to include candidates who are not registering nationally in public opinion surveys. If the number of candidates is too large to host at a single event, the party plans to host two events in the same location on consecutive nights after randomly dividing the candidates in a public selection process that would increase the number of actual debates beyond a dozen. Drawing lots strikes me as the fairest way to make sure everyone gets a fair shake, Democratic National Committee Chairman Thomas Perez said on Thursday. We want our candidates to be able to articulate their vision of America. We don't want debates to be discussions of what your hand size is. We want debates to be discussions of health care. As it did in the last presidential election, the Democratic Party will threaten to punish candidates who participate in debates outside of the official schedule. But candidates are welcome to attend forums or town halls with their competitors as long as they appear in sequence and do not directly engage with each other before voters. So the first negative about this is that they're not fully releasing the details in which, you know, a candidate will or won't qualify. So they talk about grassroots fundraising and poll numbers and whatnot. So, I mean, I would like to know more about that. Certainly, I think it is more fair to base participation and eligibility rather on more than just poll numbers, but at the same time, I do want to hear about what those qualifications need to be before making my decision. Now, the biggest negative about this is the return of the DNC exclusivity clause, where any candidate who participates in a non-DNC-sanctioned debate will be banned from participation in future DNC-sanctioned debates. Now, we know that the reason why W. Wasserman Schultz instituted this rule back in 2016 and limited debates was so that way, when people inevitably got angered at the fact that they weren't having enough debates, well, um, she could block them from going elsewhere since the DNC was only sanctioning a couple of debates. So, I don't know why this exclusivity clause is returning. It really makes no sense to me. And to me, it wouldn't be an issue if there were enough debates. Now, as for the number of 12 debates, we have six in 2019 and six more in 2020, with June and July having the first two debates. There's a break in August, and then it returns on basically a monthly basis. But is 12 debates, or potentially more if we break them off, enough? At this point, Judging by how many candidates will enter, no, that is not enough. I was hoping for at least a minimum of 20, um, excluding extra debates that we have to house additional candidates. Now, what I do like is that they're not necessarily having kids' table debates for extra candidates like they did on the GOP side, because there was always those embarrassing kids' table debates for the candidates that polled the lowest, and I think that that was kind of a way to... Um, maybe inadvertently discredit those candidates, and I don't think that something like that should happen. I do think that all voices need to be considered because even the more fringe voices who probably won't get much traction, like Andrew Wang, I think that they deserve a chance to appear on a debate stage because they'll still influence the discussion around the more prominent candidates. So, like, I want him to talk about um, universal basic income. I want Richard Ojeda to talk about anti-corruption measures because I want that to influence the other candidates. So I kind of like that they're making them basically draw lots in order to determine who will be on the first night and the second night. But 12 debates, that's really not a lot. And again, keep in mind that it will be more than 12 debates. There'll basically be 24 if, you know, it follows that there's like 20 candidates and they do two debates, you know, on each scheduled event. But I would like to see more. Um, I think that you've really got to get the word out there, and there's no reason to limit it to only 12. Um, now, again, it may very well be the case that they don't limit it to only 12. They may do more. This is only the preliminary debate schedule, but, you know, 
I just, I was hoping for more. So, I mean, this really is a mixed bag. The return of the exclusivity clause is really pointless. I mean, if you agree that we should have more debates, then there's no reason for you to penalize other candidates. They are allowing them to appear on town halls and whatnot, but if they talk to each other at that event, then they're violating the DNC exclusivity clause. Just get rid of it. I mean, even Howard Dean, of all people, thinks that the DNC exclusivity clause was a stupid idea back in 2016, and I would hope that he'd be principled and condemn it here now. But at the same time, I will say that the DNC exclusivity clause is a lot less problematic now since they are holding more debates, because again, that rule presumably was instituted to help shield Hillary Clinton and hide Bernie Sanders away from the public. So, look, it's a step in the right direction. It is a mixed bag. There are things that I find problematic, and at this point, we need more details, but credit where it's due. This isn't as bad as I had initially expected it would be. So, it's clear that Tom Perez is at least doing the bare minimum to try to cultivate support among progressives, but drop the DNC exclusivity clause rule, and let's do at least 20 debates, even if that means we have 40 debates in total, and we have two debates per each planned debate because there's so many candidates. I think that the more that we get out the word, the better it will be, and the better our chances will be, you know, going up against Donald Trump in 2020. So there you have it. I'll let you guys make your own choice. Support this podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash humanist report.